On CXO Talks today, I have with me the ever vibrant, wise, and resonant Eka Banerjee, founder of Akam Resonance, the wisdom organization harnessing the ancient knowledge of India. A Shevening Gurukul Fellow for Leadership and Excellence from University of Oxford and a best selling author of the book 52 Red Pills. With over two decades of a journey spanning across banking and then as a CEO of Future Learning and later as an entrepreneur, she has had revelations from what she calls as a three lives. Let's hear what this CXO talks. Welcome to the show, CXO Talks, Eka. I am so honored to have you. And I know for a fact that whatever pearls of wisdom will come through in this conversation today will resonate so much and they will captivate <laughs> all our audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. And it, indeed, it is a privilege to be here. Uh, so thank you for having me over. And I'm quite looking forward this, to this conversation as well. Thank you. And... Uh, by the way, you're looking very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I hadn't realized how I blend in with your sofa. Otherwise, I would have won this bright yellow color pop. <laughs> that would have been fantastic. Next time. <laughs> Next time around, for sure. So, you know what? Without much delay, one thing that I've, I'm very, very curious about, uh, for me as a CXO, for me as an entrepreneur, to handle just one life by itself is handful. And I know for a matter of fact that you have lived Three life. This is the third <laughs> life that you're living. Enlighten me, please. <laughs> Thank you. You almost make it sound like, you know, the cat with nine lives. Uh, but I think the third is a good space to be. Yes, I've actually always also believed in the magic of uh, the number three, right? So, uh, and a lot of it may actually make sense in hindsight more than it made sense in foresight. Mm -hmm. So the first life, right? The first life was... Uh, Started when I was 13 years old and, and lasted for 20 years. So I discovered I was a healer when I was 13. Uh, and then I did what every other teenager would do, which is go into denial and resentment and rebellion and anger. Because at 13, you don't want to feel like a freak. At 13, there is so much that you already have to deal with in terms of academics, career, identity, love, choices, parents, independence. There's, there's so much already happening in your life. That you don't also want to de be dealing with this person that you're becoming yeah. as the adolescent, right? Um, and so, which is why I did what every other teenager should do and would do, which is that I just blocked myself out, right? Mm. So, which is when, and, and I think it was just adolescence that lasted far too long. Um, so, that was this age that I became this very angry, very resentful, very, you know, woman on a mission, uh, rebel without a cause kind of a person. Mm -hmm. um, I started wearing these really large grunge shirts um, and baggy jeans. And I used to wear these 4G DMS boots completely to college completely please. that, you know, you, you shouldn't, you need to think I'm cool. Yeah. And you can't think I'm a woman at all because, you know, women like. Yeah. Who wants to be a girl or a woman yeah. at that age? So it was quite quite a difficult, angry age. Um, it was also the age where, because I was in denial of my own self, mm -hmm. I would do anything to earn your respect and love. I needed you to respect me. I needed you to love me. I needed you to think I'm cool. So I made all the choices that were that were determined by what would look cool. Mm. Right, so I had wanted to study science and engineering. So I took my first year. I took my IIT entrance exams. Didn't make it. Right. Up. Uh, if you didn't make it into IIT, and if you were that determined, then you should have just dropped a year, sat down, studied much harder, shiddat say, and then taken your exams yeah. again. But didn't do that because that mm -hmm. wasn't cool, right? Um, in which case you should run BSc physics. Yeah. But BSc physics was not cool. Economics was cool. Mm. So took economics, hated every single day of that three day, three year degree. Then did MBA, right? Mm. Because doing an MBA was, was cool. cool. So did MBA. Once in the MBA, uh, wanted an FMCG job because that was cool. Yeah. As it turned out, was not on a single FMCG shortlist, but the only person in my campus with a shortlist from all the four banks. So became a banker because mm. being a banker was very, very cool. cool. Right? Um, 
and respectful very respectful right so so life from the outside actually if you saw it saw it it was a very picture perfect life hmm. by the way in 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 the same phase during what then seemed like moments of insanity but in hindsight for the sanest moments one also sort of fell in love got married had children all of that happened but all of them were very angry spaces right and then i think that trigger happened when much later i realized that while from the outside my life looked picture perfect hmm. right so you were a banker you were doing well in your career married to a batch mate both of you were doing very well two good children blue chip mba blue chip jobs everything seemed to add up mm. besides my own personal happiness and unfulfillment right um but that still didn't give set a jolt at all Right. So somewhere much later into the journey, about ten, twelve years ago, mm-hmm. um, I actually had a very nasty road accident when we were in Singapore, and uh, people around me were Singapore laughing. Singapore is one yeah, of the safest. Yeah. Cities. Who has a road accident in Singapore? <laughs> Wow. So in fact, in fact, people, my friends always tell me, you know, you've gone and spoiled the safety record of a country, yeah. man. <laughs> like broke a jinx. Uh, but I feel ways. sorry for Singapore on that yeah. actually. But that was one of those reality checks, right? So it mm-hmm. was, it was almost like, um, Sonia, something far greater than me, you know, something divine had actually interfered, intervened to give me one tight slap yeah. and say, dude, get your act together. you can't be this angry resentful uh, you know rebellious screaming person grow up yeah. find yourself mm. right i i actually these were th- this is what i call the dark ages my first life were my dark ages right mm. and because i didn't want to talk to myself i used to create a lot of noise outside mm-hmm. so i was ready for a fight i was ready for a challenge i wanted to be challenged i was spoiling for a fight hmm. you know in hindsight i realized that a lot of us continue to do that to this day which yeah. is live that external script yeah. look for external validation hunt for something external to yeah. to to respect your own self yeah. because conversations with yourself are and difficult ready to always pick up a battle always i'm yeah. i'm spoiling for a fight i still remember there were days where i would go to office in the morning and you know announce at my family ki bas aaj let somebody just say a word to me today and i will sort this and surprisingly those days were the you know nicest sweetest smoothest days nobody ever Nothing. messed with me and i'd come back actually disappointed that are where is the fight where is the fight that i was looking for and live to fight another day but the whole narrative was about being at war being at war with the world everything was a fight everything was a battle to be won the narrative was about victory and defeat mm. the whole that was a whole vocabulary that was a whole conversation mm. those were your dopamine triggers those were my trig- triggers as well that is that is actually what i thrived on yeah right um till we reached a stage where you know like the world gets back to you the universe Uh, creates its own moments and has its own plan for you so when this accident happened about about 12 years ago um it it was a shock to the system mm. because suddenly it wasn't about healing anybody else it was it was about survival mm. right um and and it's a very personal journey but even from the time of the accident to what i call my rebirth was a good two years mm. right? for the first six months it was it was actually sonia like um uh, just embracing yourself so i paid off what i call my personal debts mm. so i have lost the right in life to say to someone that look i have done things for you and you haven't mm. you know i've lost the right in life to um to stand in um any kind of arrogant uh generosity right? so that's what happened then in those 6 months mm. uh there were the next 6 months i went back to yoga i went back to meditation it was about just healing myself then there were the next 6 months where we sort of shifted back to india um and that was the narrative where that was a time where i went back to my roots i went back and got closures i went back to the mountains so by the way every year i yeah. disappear into the mountains for a year every year since then 
So that's for how my long? Place to, for about a week or so. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But that's my space, my time. Uh huh. Um. Uh. Went back to the mountains. Went back to my old school principal friends. Everybody. Just to say that, look, if something happens to me tomorrow, you need to know you were important to me. So, yeah. had my social, emotional closures, yeah. and I think the last thing that was left was my corporate uh, closure. I hadn't reached corporate nirvana yet. Mm. Remember, I was in the corporate world not because I wanted to be in the corporate world, yeah, but I was so in the was corporate world because it was cool, cool to be to there. Be. It was cool to be there. It was the script I was playing by. It was the classic MBA script I was living by, and the external validation that he was seeking, Absol- respect, respect. respect. Um, and so because because there was no respect internally for my own self, then I had to seek it yeah. externally. Yeah. Uh, so when that happened, I uh, joined my last corporate job in that um, year. And about six, eight, nine months later, when I left, and and that was that day of the rebirth, Sonia. And I still remember that day so vividly. I had just resigned from my job, um, and I came back, and there was a friend's birthday party that evening. Mm-hmm. I can't even begin to tell you that feeling of lightness. That was the day that the first rebirth happened and the second life began. I was just empty. There was no, there was nothing left in me that day. Mm. I had paid off all my debts. I didn't owe anybody a thing on the planet. Nobody owed me a thing. Mm. Had I died and gone to heaven, and of course I would have gone to heaven. That I have no doubts about in my mind. <laughs> uh, I would have gone with a zero PNL. Yeah. No, no love, desire, ambition, aspiration. Nothing. Yeah. It's just khali, mm. and then from the next day began what I call my second life. Mm. Uh, the second life was actually the life of the embrace. If the first was about the dark ages, mm. the second one was exploring myself. The second one was about figuring out, learning to love yourself, accept yourself, embrace yourself, mm. have those conversations which I had avoided all the last all, twenty years yeah. to find out who I was, why I was, how I the was, what ones. did I want to do. Ah, they were tough questions, but it was a very delightful journey because. I had suddenly discovered that I was far more interesting than you to my own you were. self, huh? And that I could actually spend my life with myself and not wow. seeking external validation. It was it was actually one of those you know aha moments of wow, this is fun. Yeah. And so that's when Sonia, that second life, which lasted almost about eight ten years, was the time that I uh, explored myself, learned to love myself, I re-educated myself. So I went through multiple sciences. I went back and studied again. Uh, I studied anthropology and psychology and neurosciences and uh, mythology. Mythology, of course. And yeah, that that's when mythology happened. That's when wisdom happened. That's when the study of wisdom happened. Um, and do you know what was even more interesting, Sonia? About two years into this journey, mm-hmm. when I was prepared for the long haul, right? Mm-hmm. So that was my first entrepreneurial stint mm-hmm. after my corporate stint. Yeah. Well, that was my second entrepreneurial stint. I was a wealth entrepreneur in Singapore. Uh-huh. And this was my second stint. Uh-huh. Um, so I was ready for the long haul. So yeah. that's when I set up my um, leadership advisory firm. And I was quite willing to wait the while, right? Mm-hmm. For two years, very committed to it. As it turned out, Sonia, two years within that, I actually got offered the role of a CEO at Future Group, um, heading one of India's largest skilling and employability companies. Wow. Right. And again, in hindsight, till I was chasing that classic corporate Hindu rate of growth mm. ladder, you know, mm. your AVP to VP to SVP yeah. to EVP. Yeah. I wouldn't have made CEO anywhere then. But the moment I stepped into my own self and did and what I happened. really, truly wanted to do, yeah. I actually made the first CEO of my B-School batch, man or woman. Wow. Right. And I realized that it, it's something I'm very deeply grateful for. I'm very grateful that I was able to transition from that first life mm. to the second life. So that was my second life. Mm. Which lasted for a good six, eight years. And it was a journey of pure exploration and great fun. And I discovered I was a much better person than I thought I was actually. Yeah. Um, interestingly, and much cooler in much many ways. Much cooler and interestingly, Sonia, the moment I started respecting myself, I realized I was also getting far greater respect from the world around me. Right? And uh, that to me was quite the aha moment because I didn't think, I had yeah. lived in denial on that while. Yeah. Right? And then the third life happened. So the third life happened while in, in I think 2018. Uh, when I was in uh, Oxford. So I was doing my Chivning Gurukul Fellowship there mm. at Oxford. And I still remember towards the end of that journey, it was, it was I think, just after Diwali. So it would have been end of November mm-hmm. kind of a journey. And uh, so on this, on this really cold, wet, 
uh, winter dull grey day of London. London, yeah. I woke up and it was like just this light of conscious clarity. There were no blacks and whites and greys. It was just bright light. Wow. Okay. And I still remember that I had my first meeting of the day that day with my coach who was the 65-year-old wonderful woman. And at 8.30 on that rainy, windy, dull grey day, I walked in. And she looked at me, she said, Eka, something's happened. And I was like, I'm just smiling <laughs> like, a, like a Cheshire cat smile. <laughs> so she looked at me and she, you know, she said two things, Sonia, which have stayed with me. Uh, the first thing she said, she said, you know, Eka, it's like you've been pregnant with something for the last year, year and a half. And this, your three months here at Oxford is your period of delivery and confinement. Mm. So you've given birth. I thought it was... It was uncanny that she used that word yeah. of birth and rebirth and yeah. new life yeah. um, because she had no context on me. Yeah. Right. Uh, and the second thing she said, she said, you know, Eka, because because in the whole Jungian uh, psychology, mm -hmm. we believe that every child that's born is born a wounded child. They've already mm. been through a battle to be born. Yeah. She said, Eka, while you are nursing this newly born wounded child, mm. don't forget to heal the injured mother. Sonia, wow! Yeah, that that set the tone for the rest of my life. I am, and and that's how I stepped into my third life. I came back to India, and and this this third life. So from there, it took me two years to um, articulate what I really wanted to do, that passion, that purpose, um, and and get the logistics around it sorted. Uh, but that's when I moved out on my own, and since this third life has happened, Sonia, I can't even begin to tell you the grace that this lives in yeah. there is just grace and gratitude to hindi mein we say na sahaj everything is just so graceful there are no insecurities there are no fears there are no conflicts mm. there are no grace it's just so easy it is just so sahaj it is just so graceful yeah. that i'm just stepping into myself and and just being me yeah and sonia i can't be more grateful I mean, and the only the only emotion that I'm filled with at any at any given point of time is just gratitude and pure love. Because your cup is completely full and overflowing I, I'm now. Brimeth over. Yeah, it's, it's my cup just brimeth, that, over. brimeth over, right? And that's the third life. So those are those three lives of from from the dark ages and dark angry ages to the age of exploration and discovery yeah. to this that I call just just my life of resonance yeah. and. I live in gratitude. So, so that's, that's, yeah, that's those three lives. That's, uh, you know, you beautifully summed it into one word, uh, you know, right from moving from that age of dark age, and dark times to being in a place where you were discovering and exploring yourself and now being in the space of resonance. So resonance for everybody means that the sound of the deep, uh, really deep sound, right? Which is, which has a very calming, centered quality to it. Sonia, that's what it does. What resonance really is, and I'm going back to class 10 physics. Yeah. Resonance is simply when two frequencies align. Mm -hmm. The whole is greater than sum of parts. The, yeah, the output indeed. frequency is much greater than the sum of sum the of amplitude it. of the two individual frequencies, right? So to me, being at resonance is the is the luxury of being able to punch far above your weight. It's that luxury of, and, and you know, you can only be at resonance, again, pure physics, mm. when you're at your natural frequency. Mm. As long as you are, as long as you have layers around you, as long as you have scripts around you, as, you're, as long as you're running external, uh, on external frequencies, however close they are to yours, mm. you know, physics says that at the point of interference, mm. there's friction. Yeah. There's bound to be loss of energy. Yeah. Uh, so no matter how close you are at your natural frequency, but the fact is if it's externally aligned at the point of interference, there will be friction. Yeah. There will be loss of energy in yeah. its own form. You can only be at absolute efficiency and resonance at your natural frequency. At your natural frequency. Very true. And the more I think about it from the perspective of, you know, coming to the fact that we're talking about the CXO journey, you're talking about uh, your journey that you know you have risen from one part to another you've had your falls there are a lot of people that I know the CXOs that you speak with the CXOs that I speak to 
who go through a similar journey however to acknowledge to be aware and to come to a space where you know what your natural frequency is is a very long journey yes where does it begin for people who are high achievers who are still going through a lot of turmoil within yes but do not know what to do you know sonia so even before we come to how do you get there yeah i have a question for you mm mm-hmm. why do we not do it yeah you've lived the same life as i have yeah right yeah why do we not do this why why don't we naturally operate at our natural frequency hmm. what makes us operate at um at at scripts that are meant for others yeah now whether that script is about financial freedom whether that script is about power it's about position it's about usually it's about wealth uh, mm. that's that's the easiest uh, you know uh, marker in that mm. sense but tell me why do we play those scripts why are we naturally not like this because this is not how we were born right right we were born in a natural simple, frequency free and fearless yeah and the only one fear that a child is born with do you know what that is there's only one fear that we are born with the fear of not being fed not being loved no hunger hunger all that is acquired mhm love hunger abandonment separation uh, insecurities everything's acquired there's only one biological fear you're born with and what is that the fear of falling that's it that's it that's the only fear you are biologically born with everything else is acquired mm. so we were born fearless yeah then how did we end up in a place where we where we are not fearless today where we operate behind these filters masks of fears that we carry we hold them they they, they become our excuses right yeah. but why why do we not operate at natural frequency we are not aware we are not even aware how to recognize so why are, why don't we want to be aware i would love to know this because it's convenient it's very convenient so, and and i remember this and wait the experiences that i'm very grateful for having lived through the dark ages long enough i possibly now hold uh, this this freedom and this liberation very dearly mm. but it's because the the alternative to living the script is to take responsibility right it is so much easier to be a victim it's so much it's easier it's very comforting it's very comforting it's very convenient and it gives you the 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 opportunity to not be yourself yeah it's so much easier right to blame somebody else yeah because the alternative to that is to take responsibility then there's there's nobody left to blame after that and would i be right to say that in your case for that matter the accident in singapore turned out to break that inertia yes of staying in that zone of being comfortable with that identity of being a victim in so many i think ways. i think i had already begun that journey a little while ago um but did nothing about it mm-hmm. see that that fire is within all of us sonia that light is already there yeah it is dying to burst forth yeah it is deeply uncomfortable true already there right so it's a question of just how much can you blind yourself to it and eventually it catches up in my case i am very grateful that it caught up in the form of an accident some you know 12 years ago or whatever number of years ago but usually it doesn't catch up like that usually it catches up in the form of disease it catches up in the form of frustration mm. it catches up in the form of this perpetual anger mm. depression uh, you've seen so a many. lot of depression so that's how it catches up and catches up it does without fail burnout for leaders burnout for leaders stressed out depression actually all the words of all 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 your uh, new age issues yeah uh and and a lot of it is by the way pure victim victim playing and and anger and rebellion so for me those are red flags you said how do you become aware hmm. right for me awareness starts at your behavior levels every time sonia that you are angry hurt mm. upset offended irritated sarcastic sad any one of those it's coming from a space of helplessness it's coming from a space of loss of control mm. so every time you come up against those it is because you are operating from a space that is not within you yeah or it's within you but it's not yours 
Like I realized my pattern on this. Hmm. Right? We were raised to be, and and I think that's the right way to raise children. But we were raised to be very approval seeking kids. Absolutely. Right? You know, look, what they say. Sharma ji ka beta. Uh, make sure you're kind to somebody else. Look at how they're thinking. Look at how they are feeling, etc., etc. Which, Which is happens good. still. And, and well. I think, and I think it's the right way to raise your children. Right? You can't raise raise mm-hmm. them insensitively. But I realized, Sonia, that every time I got angry, one mm-hmm. could get angry about anything. Mm-hmm. Every time I got angry, there was a person at the other end. Mm-hmm. So it was a person issue. I didn't get angry about money. I didn't get angry about achievement. I didn't get angry because somebody else didn't do something on a job. I got angry every time. It had to come back to how I was being treated. or i assumed i was being disrespected or you're not being polite to me or you disrespected me mm-hmm. or how dare you make me wait like that you know there was always one of those how you treat me issues yeah. around it yeah and the reason we don't let go of our fears why do you think we don't let go of them like i said one is take responsibility right, right? because uh, again to let go of that is to let go of an identity and that's the only way now i know how to live right yeah right so my fear my personal fear was even when i realized this epiphany happened mm. that you know i get angry every time there's a person issue around it and mm. i need to break through it mm. i dare not i dare not because my fear behind that people approval behaviors approval seeking behaviors is saying that if i don't be approval seeking i am going to be obnoxious mm. and rude and self self centered mm. and i'm going to become this unbearable person to be around mm. and that's a, and that's a valid fear right for somebody else by the way who holds on to let's say financial well being or has a number in mind and financial insecurity right the fear they are hiding behind it what what's what's holding them them from pursuing their dreams is let's yeah. say financial security is the fear that if i start pursuing that i will become poor yeah and you'll realize that every time they get angry it's about a money issue right so depending on on what's that fear you're hiding behind yeah watch your emotions because your emotions will tell you what your shadows are what are you hiding behind mm. and then wo kehta hai na mountain dew says no dar ke aage jeet de this this wasn't meant to be a plug for mountain dew at all i think you should <laughs> charge them money for it but having said that the fact is that i discovered that beyond that fear of being approval seeking when i actually worked at it instead of becoming obnoxious and you know rude and selfish and self centered uh uh-huh. it actually liberated me to love sonia it allowed me to love fearlessly yeah because suddenly if i'm I, if i'm if i have no expectations from you hmm. and i'm not expecting you to uh, love me back yeah. i can actually say i love you love to you, you without wanting you or needing you to say without back to me without filters without intentions without any expectations there's no counterparty on this yeah then i'm actually free to love and that's what i discovered that's what that freedom is that's so much liberty and freedom there is absolute liberation and weightlessness absolutely it and that's the grace right yeah suddenly i suddenly i am love yeah i don't need wow. to be in love i am love yeah because that's who i am that's who i am that is who i really was hiding behind this whole you know approval seeking layers of facade yeah. of you know you must respect me i need to be cool all the validation that i was seeking for myself need that needed to come from you earlier hmm now comes from within suddenly there's no counterparty and you know now i look at it from the lens of professionals from the lens of cxos there was a time when it was okay to be an autocratic leader hmm hmm right hmm? but now no longer is it okay yet people somewhere feel the need to be obeyed tell me why where does the need to be obeyed come from so i'm not getting into the matter of times because while some of it may be related to the times they are changing hmm a lot of it is related to who we are as human beings hmm. of course there's a shift in consciousness and we must have a conversation later about this shift that's happening from the age of the industry to the age of uh, information to the age of idea and now the age of the individual right. but that's a much larger phenomenon right right as people we have been exactly this hmm. ever since we became human beings hmm. right the shift that's happening or the shift that you're talking about is the is the is the greater consciousness and awareness 
of the consequences that fears bring. Correct. And I think also by the time one reaches that CXO stage, hmm. some journey of life has happened. Absolutely. Right? So some scripts have been played out that what Joshe Javani of the youth has, has happened. Correct. Right? We are all at a stage where there's been some heartbreak professionally and personally. There has been They've some been loss, lost. some victory. We've lost some loved ones. Yeah. Uh, we have a reasonable idea of what our corporate caliber is, of how Correct. high, how much higher we are going to rise. There is some sense of immortality and invincibility that has been lost. The youth, ka, you know, where there has yeah. been some health checks, health scares, uh, some breakdowns, mm -hmm. um, some joys. Mm -hmm. So the good thing about being in the CXO space is that we are exploring, we are introspecting and we are figuring out uh, what the rest of our lives is. Typically, yeah. we are just about 40, right? So Typically, yeah. So we're still figuring out how the next 40 or 50 or 60 years will play out, will play out in relationships. So a lot of life is changing already. Yeah. So maybe, therefore, it's actually a very good time hmm. from the point of view of natural flow of life. Yeah. And uh, shedding of those vanity absolutely. metrics. Absolutely. You, you, you're preparing yourself. You're assessing yourself. You're introspecting and rebuilding for your resonance. Yeah. The risk is, Sonia, for a, and I won't use the word CXO, but for any person who doesn't go through this journey now, hmm. that's when disease catches up. That's when you have your fears to hold and stay. Yeah. That's when they become your identity. Yeah. So far, you've been living out the scripts. So that's fine. Yeah. But if you don't do them now, if you don't address them, don't shed them now, mm -hmm. then they're your identity for the rest of your life. You know, I've often said this, that when people become old, uh, so I've known of some very good looking young people uh -huh. who weren't pretty old people. Mm. And I've often found that by the time you're old, what your physical features are, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What matters is the person you are inside yeah. of you that reflects on the yeah. person you are on the outside. Yeah. Right. And I found, um, irrespective of physical features, it's the people who are freest, most honest to them, their own selves, mm -hmm. who are at peace and contentment, who actually Do not have baggages. look much better better yeah. who have, don't have any baggages yeah. and then there, you see some some old people who are really uh, you know who still look angry and there's a Hindi word for it kuntit hmm. and who look like you know still holding and bitter. griping and bitter and, and and I feel sad for them because you were beautiful people yeah not just physically but you were yeah. beautiful people yeah who and just didn't all embrace people, all we were born beautiful and free yeah. So yeah, that's that's how I think about it. So the first step is awareness. Yeah. Right. That in that journey, the first step is awareness of emotion. Every time that you get angry, upset, hurt, watch for it. Yeah. Because that's a shadow. Yeah. And it's I, something that you have inside of you, but it's not you. Yeah. Find the source. Yeah. Much easier said than done. So the second thing to watch out for, which is much easier to watch for, is your words. So wow. every time that you use words like supposed to, must, should. Mm -hmm. Sahi hai, galat hai, right, wrong, good, bad. Mm -hmm. Every time you use these words, you're operating from a limiting belief. That's not coming from within you, but wow. that you're holding on to. Let's examine this. Interesting. Give me a statement. The statement that I can give you right now is that I feel I'm really beautiful inside out. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel the work that I've done so far with the team that we have created oh. at Fine is something that makes me very proud. But Ismeto, there is no self-limiting belief. You haven't used any of the catchwords in I'm this. I'm sitting in the <laughs> in the wisdom and resonance of Eka energy. So, kuch to effect hoga. It'll rub off. <laughs> no, no. But let's take one of those uh, belief systems. So, I am the okay. I am the CTO of an organization, and I must become the CEO. I must become this. Right? Mm -hmm. And and it's a very standard belief, right? Mm. Or the next step that I that I should apply mm. for is a CEO role. I must move to general management from um, the CTO. So I'm I'm a kick ass CTO. Mm. Uh, but my next career move must be a general management CEO role. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's examine this. Look at the amount of pressure. So you're a kick ass CTO. You know your technology, you know your work, you really enjoy it there. Yeah. But the moment you're operating under that belief, 
it's not your script bhagwan ji didn't tell you that all ctos must become ceos hmm. it's a script that you have been. created or has been created for you in from your environment that you picked within. up you might not enjoy that general management role at all mm-hmm. but you must become ceo hmm. because it's cool cool yeah and look at the amount of pressure you play for your pay so let's assume you even get that role because you're qualified for it yeah. you're a kick ass ceo yeah. you know your work yeah. you know the business yeah. so you get that role hmm. now you might enjoy it or you might not enjoy it if you enjoy it yeah then good because this is what you also wanted wanted to. but if you did this because this is how a cto career must progress and how it will get you validation from outside for the next big thing you've got your tick mark no yeah it's it's like my banking journey where you got all the tick marks yeah but you will be unfulfilled within mm. you will f- and and at this age and stage that we are all in that unfulfillment will manifest mm. so so any limiting belief like in our household for instance and and the rule is very simple right if any one of us i am right you are wrong mm. in what context it's in my household and we have two daughters who are 20 and 16 so it's a very woke mm. household and of course. uh with with hormonal teenagers uh, a great conversational household yeah right? but so the rule is very simple if you ever come to me with an opinion you can have your opinion but till you can tell me why the other side holds the views that they do mm-hmm. your opinion is invalid and i found myself and this this is also by the way how we put pressure on ourselves and hinge ourselves onto it yeah. so sonia i realized this very early right that the daughter daughters must have been 7 or 10 uh-huh and i realized that as the mother because i was constantly saying a good mother must ensure must. that children brush on time do their homework on time have their uniforms etc etc you know the, the, the essays we were taught when we were little right. children the adarsh vidyarthi adarsh neta hamara neta kaisa ho all of those things sanskari right? bachcha every one of whatever. those everything yeah. that we hold ourselves a good yeah. wife must do this a yeah. good leader must do this and it's all gender agnostic in fact i think it's Correct. it's it's even greater pressure for for the male leader than the woman leader yeah. but it's high pressure boys must not cry boys must not cry i feel sorry for boys uh boys must not cook etc etc right yeah. so obviously we've all lived through those lives yeah. so as the mother i remember i used to be the screaming banshee <laughs> you know because i was a working mother yeah and so the guilt the guilt trip was even greater of course and so i my ch- children got shouted at even more because if my children didn't brush it's a greater reflection of who i am as the who mother who i am yeah. and already i'm beating myself down on being the working mother so and and as the banshee i would obviously go around banshee all the time till at one point of time sonia i realized i'm not that person i am not the screaming banshee type hmm so i actually sat them down and had a conversation with them they were 7 years old one was 7 one was 10 mm-hmm. so i'm telling the 7 year old that look dude if you don't brush your teeth now i'm not going to the dentist my teeth are fine they are happy they are healthy i am not going to suffer pain you will if you don't brush yeah. if you don't do your homework i will not be left illiterate hmm. i have done my padhai likhai hmm. right your teacher will humiliate you and you will be left illiterate yeah. so your consequences are yours right so that little thing at 7 year old turns around <laughs> looks at me and says what you my mother it is your job to do that <laughs> I said, "Hello, it's not my job. I provided the toothbrush and the toothpaste." Who gave this job description? Ah, huh, exactly. I said, "So there is the toothbrush and the toothpaste." And I said, "Seven year old, you know what job a mother is supposed to do? Why don't you go brush your teeth instead of telling me what I need to do for you?" Yeah, you know. And suddenly the atmosphere has changed. Hmm. So now it's it's you are the owner of your life. I don't control your life. Yeah. And therefore, you don't get to control mine. Hmm. You know. So the, this conversation has <laughs> happened with. with spouse with siblings with parents my mother had cancer very recently oh and uh, after that there was this one day where she was very very upset about it etc etc so i was explaining to her the whole healing context of cancer and uh-huh. how it happens and where it happens and what are you holding on to and you know suddenly she went on this trip of saying no no just because now i've had cancer everybody gets to take pot shots at me i said sorry i said this is not a mother daughter conversation yeah i'm not talking to you as your daughter yeah i said this is a very person to person it's not even a woman to woman conversation mm-hmm. so let's drop mm-hmm. the roles we play for the people we are very profound and powerful 
So yeah, so that's the second step, and actually that that makes life so much easier. Just watching your words every time you find yourself using these words, pause because yeah. you're hiding behind a limiting belief. And the more I think about it, as we talk, is that as CXOs, as leaders, a lot of time one belief that is very often reinforced is that you must not display emotion. Yeah, you have to be the alpha. You have to know it all. You must operate from a position of power and authority. I remember when I became the CEO, there used to be, you know, a lot of uh, conversation around me because my team would walk in, right? Mm -hmm. And present an idea. And I'd just look at them and say that if I've understood good, if I haven't understood, actually turn around and say, you know what, just walk me through this like I was a four-year-old. Wow. And sometimes a lot of it would fall by the wayside, those ideas then. Because they had also walked in, you know, impressed the CEO with, you know, some jazz and some numbers and some presentation. Of course. Which I'm also supposed to preserve that facade of, you know, the emperor's new clothes. Yeah. So it's a facade that I'm also supposed to preserve that, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. The big words and the big numbers and the big presentations. And and the more I hold myself to the leader who must know it all, yeah. the less I know. The less I learn, yeah, and the lesser I even do, yeah. Right. So yeah, it's, it's a journey. You're right. A lot of us hold ourselves to to all kinds of roles, responsibilities, self limiting beliefs, and they reflect in the words we use. Simplest way to address this. Absolutely, and mm. you know, you like you said that identify those words, start becoming aware. Uh, now that we are aware, now that I know the words that I'm using. What must I do next as a leader? Very nice. I love this question. <laughs> and and just so that your audience knows, this wasn't a planted question at all. <laughs> so the third one, and that if you ask me, Sonia, is, has been my forever trigger, right? Um, there's this whole shlok that we grew up on as children, right? You've uh-huh. heard it. Asatoma satkamaya, tamasoma jyotirkamaya. Right? So you don't take away darkness. You just introduce Bring in light. light. You don't not lie. You just speak the truth, mm-hmm. right? Um, in the West and in modern science, this is called neuroplasticity. Mm-hmm. Right. So the brain is a binary organ. Right. The brain doesn't have the concept of either something is there or it's not there. It's Black a zero or, or a right. one. Ha. Zero or a one. Ha. Either it's there or not there. Ha. There's no concept of undoing something. The brain doesn't mm-hmm. understand the word no. It can't stop or undo or not do something. So it's like saying that uh, do not think about the purple elephant. Ha, I was just going to say that. That do anything, but don't think about pink monkeys. <laughs> so what do you what do you think you are right no, now? I'm just thinking pink monkeys. <laughs> no, where did the purple elephant go? <laughs> and I'm looking at the combination the of pink and purple, and I'm I'm like, okay, am I seeing a monkey? Am I seeing an elephant? Exactly, exactly, my boy. So and, I, and I'll illustrate with this wonderful example, right? So if you're a if you eat non-veg and you are uh, giving up on it, you want to give up on non-veg food, right? So you go in the evening or you want to quit anything. It doesn't matter what you're quitting, whether it's weight loss. The body does not know how to lose weight. Mm -hmm. The body knows how to be fit. It can do something affirmative. It doesn't know how not to do something. Hmm. Right. So in fact, there was this very brilliant study done where uh, these, this group of children was split into two. Mm -hmm. One half of the children, one one set, uh, one, the half of one set was basically told, carry this tray to the top of the stairs. The other half was told that don't fall down with this set of trays. Guess which group they were falls. Of course, the... The second one because they were focusing on falling. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So similarly, if you are, uh, for instance, trying to turn vegetarian and you go to this party and uh, the table is laden with all kinds of food, very nice kebabs and butter chicken and really nice uh, tandoori chicken and all of that is there, right? Fish tikka, everything. Gorgeous non-veg food and there's veg food. You spend that entire evening in conversation and active engagement with that non-veg food. Huh. What good food? No, no, but I will not eat it. Oh, but I will test my willpower. No, 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 no. This is no, no. I am so good. No, I can't afford it. Shall I have a little bit? No, no, let's not, etc., etc. That entire evening, your engagement has been only with that non veg food. Right. Whereas there is a vegetarian in the room. Right. That vegetarian is seeing exactly that same food. Same platter. But that doesn't even register with you. Hmm. Right. So that's the stage to reach. Hmm. 
not about undoing something. And the simplest trick that I have found. Actually, before that, I will tell you something. So, when we do anger management, do you remember Chakdi India? Ha. Right? So, there's that Sadar girl who gets very angry. Very angry, ha. And her mother says, Ki beta pani pile. Ha. Right? That's because the brain, apart from being binary, right. cannot multitask. It can only do one thing, one at, a thing time. at a time. And mm. this is something that yeah. a lot of us need to learn, by the way, but that's yeah. a separate session. Yeah. Now, the reason that we snap anger is that we want to create a neural pathway. We want to create an alternate neural pathway, mm. which doesn't sort of follow the path of anger and high blood pressure and dilated pupils and getting you ready mm. to fight. Mm. But snap that pathway. Mm. So it doesn't matter what you do to snap that pathway. Mm-hmm. So if you, whether you drink water or take 10 deep breaths or count from 1 to 10, doesn't matter what it is. Mm. But the moment the brain starts doing that, the anger pathway is disrupted and snapped. Mm. Mm. Right? Because at any given point of time, you can yeah. either uh, either be angry mm. or focus or you on the motor act of drinking on water. If you try and both do both, you'll choke. Yeah. yeah. That's, which is why you snap the existing pathway. So just like, you know, it is also said that if you're not feeling okay, just try and smile. You know, just you're not feeling okay, just smile. Focus on the smile. Focus on the smile. Correct. And naturally, you won't even realize within moments, it will be dissolved. Correct. Yeah. So you just replace it with the affirmative. Yeah. So my secret hack around this, Sonia, mm-hmm. is stop using negative words. Mm-hmm. The moment you attempt to use a negative word, mm-hmm. replace it with the alternative. Right? So let's try this. Your child comes to you. And says, can I watch TV? The natural reaction no. would be no. No not, and end of story. No, not right now. No and not right now, end of story. Yeah. Now if you can't say no. How about going to the drawing board and drawing something? Would you like to go down and play? Do you want us to do How about we go for a walk? Your homework or whatever. But do you realize you're forcing yourself to think of an alternative? Wow. In the process, two things are happening. One, of course, is that you are setting up an alternate pathway for yourself. But more importantly, you are also letting go of a limiting belief. Mm -hmm. That default no Mm. came from a space of thoughtlessness, of unawareness. So you also don't know why you are saying no. Why can't I watch TV? Why Mm. are you saying no? Just because you are the mother and the child. Mm. And we must follow that drill. Mm. So the moment you snap that, you also let go of that limiting belief and open yourself up to alternatives. You start questioning your own beliefs. The moment you start questioning your beliefs, it yeah. steps back into that phase of control and your emotions. Yeah. Imagine your team member coming to you in the peak uh, peak sales season and saying, can I take chutti? I was just about to ask for this example. That's it. <laughs> what would you say? No. <laughs> Are you mad? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Not right now. Versus not saying a no. Yeah. And then how does the conversation flow? How about we park it next week? Or do you really need this right now? Yeah. You know, we're in the middle of sales season. How can we make it work? Yeah. Would you be able to give us three hours from there? I yeah. understand you must be asking because you have some reasons. Yeah. But you know the context. Tell me yeah. how can we make it work? Yeah. Do you, would, you, would it be able to... You, you start exploring possibilities. So... Uh, and and the more I think about it, Eka, I feel that this also ensures that you focus from the lens of compassion. It automatically brings you into the space. The moment you are thinking and becoming aware. Yeah. The it's just awareness, Sonia. The moment you start becoming aware. Mm-hmm. You start letting go of yeah. your beliefs, of your limitations. We just follow those scripts, like I said, because it's convenient. Yeah. And this little act of not using negative words or pausing when there's a negative word yeah. allows you to break through that script. Yeah. Then my CTO can actually ask that, do I, is that the only option that I have? Who is the time right now? For? Or who am I doing it for? Yeah. Do I want it for the money? Do I want it for the prestige? Do I want it for fulfillment? What am I going to do better at? What if there's something bigger and better I want to do? Correct. So it allows you to break through that. So that one little habit. Yeah. But basically it's a three-step process. One first level is becoming aware of your emotions, yeah. circle of control and concern. Um, what, what, by the way, we call Kshetra in the Bhagavad Gita. Mm-hmm. It's again, gorgeous metaphysical yeah. topic. 
And the second one is about karma, focusing on the here and the now mm -hmm. and letting go of the life as it should be, supposed to be, must be, ideality for what is. Beautiful. And the third one is about replacing the negative with the with alternative. With the alternative. With the affirmative. With the affirmative. <laughs> so think about it. My first, the, the three lives I spoke of, right? That first life, the dark ages, was about control versus concern. Hmm. It was about Kshetra, hmm. when I wanted everything under my control, hmm. including your behaviors. Hmm. I wanted to control your behavior yeah. of liking, loving and respecting me. Yeah. Right. And that's my first dark ages. The second one is exploration. Questioning your words, your beliefs, your limiting beliefs. What are the scripts I'm playing with? How are they holding me back? How have they served me? How have they not served me? Am right. I holding on to some notions of a role and responsibility? Right. Uh, I may enjoy doing the dishes if I'm if I'm the man. Hmm. But uh, as a man, am, why am I not supposed to do the dishes? Hmm. What am I holding myself to? What are my self-limiting hmm. beliefs? That's that age of exploration. Hmm. And now that third age, like I said, is the age of grace. It's grace. the age of the alternative. There yeah. is, there are no negatives. There are no impossibilities. There are no conflicts. Nothing. It's just grace, happiness. Yeah, and and resonance. And resonance. Resonance. And uh, you know, one is that now I as a leader. I'm aware that these are the three things that I need to build within myself to be able to, you know, really become more, to, to let's say just tap into the highest potential of my being. The best in me. Yeah. Now comes the part where as an organization that I'm building, I want to inculcate this as a culture. Where does that begin? The short answer is hire Eka and Ekam to do this for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pure plug. <laughs> uh, no, but the long answer is uh, that it starts from you. Yeah. If you can do this and, and see, think about it. Not using negative words is at the behavior level. Right. The fact that it has implications right up at the thought uh, attitude level and the value belief level yeah. plays out eventually. Yeah. But at the behavior level, it's a very simple thing to incorporate. Right. So when you when you do these culture building things, first mm. you need to know what's the kind of organization you want to be. Mm. Do you want to be a curious organization or do you want to be a exploratory organization? Do you want to be a, a process organization or do you want to be a people organization, etc. You make those choices. Then you institutionalize those behaviors around it. The behaviors are very, very easy to institutionalize. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're the founder startup and your rule in the office yeah. for everybody is that nobody is to use negative words. Hmm. End of story. And they're not to be used in, in conversation, hmm. not in uh, texts, emails, groups, nothing. Hmm. It'll take time. It's like, you know, if you don't, if you go and pick up 15 kg weight on one yeah. day and do your bicep curls, your dolas are you not happening get, on that day. Huh. But it needs those reps, muscle it building. needs the practice. Yeah. It is a muscle. Yeah. Once it gets built, it gets built. So yeah. culture, unlike a weather, hmm. culture is a climate. It happens hmm. over time. Hmm. But it has to be a series of Consistent, consistent weathers. weathers. So one month you can, depending on what are the culture, what is the culture you want? Right. Right. I, are you, and, and the question starts with yourself because this will bring its own challenges. Right. If you allow people to not use negative words in your organization yeah. and you can't use them either, then everything is up for question. Absolutely. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Self-limiting beliefs. If you allow, if you tell your organization that, look, nobody is, we can't be operating between, uh, behind self-limiting beliefs and we are just, we are a green field. Mm. Right? Are you ready for those questions to be challenged? Mm. Mm. Are you okay for people to come in shorts and t-shirt? Mm. And then for, you know, for them to say, why? I mean, it's okay, right? What's yeah. wrong with that? Yeah. So are you prepared for it? If mm. you're prepared for it, then creating a set of behavior, uh, what we call culture codex. So culture codex, cul Cultures work on codex. Codex mm. are these little codes mm -hmm. that are inserted in programs mm -hmm. that basically unlock the entire program for you. That's what culture codex do. Mm -hmm. So you institute them through various um, media. That right. media can be food, language, arts, talk, music, mm. uh, signatures of your emails. It doesn't matter. So there's a whole exercise Smaller, basically everywhere, just leave that essence Correct. of the culture, right? It populates everywhere. Right. Uh, and that if, again, I understand that comes top down. It begins with the leader, yes. not without the leader. Yes. 
So uh, that's something that I think is a beautiful takeaway for me. And, and it's practiced consistently. Right. You yeah. can't uh, you you can't abandon culture. Yeah. Very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very dangerous place to be. Yeah. And it's, it's a very conscious call. It's, very it's aware built over call. time. Of course, it cannot be abandoned overnight. And you talked about consistency. Something that I often love saying, Eka, is that um, leaders, or call them good leaders, or call them leaders, you know, they're not good, bad leaders. Leaders are leaders. Wear a cape. So something that I say, you know, cape <laughs> is what, of course, the superheroes, the Marvel comics, the DC comics, uh, superheroes and super <laughs> heroines wear, but their leaders wearing capes too. And I see you donning that cape beautifully. But <laughs> what does that cape really signify here? So, you know, C of course is consistency. Yes, it's, it's courage. Yes, uh, it's compassion. Yes, it's curiosity. It's curiosity. And uh, A is yeah. authenticity. Yeah, A is authenticity. Wow. Uh, P for me stands for passion, uh, purpose, perseverance, wow, persistence, mm. and E is empathy. You know, I think that just beautifully says about you as a leader, and that tells me about what you do when you create that culture and work with leaders and CXOs. But tell me this: you've been working with it's such a powerful acronym. I'm still there absorbing right now. it. <laughs> And Good I just quickly moved. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll, I'll absorb this one of those things that I will go back and come back to you with questions on because I think it's a very powerful place yeah. that you're talking about. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So and, saying something. you know, whenever I look at a leader, I actually imagine them standing this way. And one of my, one of my things is that, you know, eventually I want to be in a place that whoever I have as a guest on CXO Talks should go back with this mini them in a superhero position wearing that cape, which has all those uh, words from the acronym embedded in that cape nice. is something that I... That has to. <laughs> I am sure now that so you've said it, it so, so be it. it. I want to understand, you know, all this wisdom that you have accumulated mm. uh, from all that you have traversed in your mm. journey. All the ancient wisdom, let me be specific. Who are some leaders, you know, give me three names or maybe more that you see have really embodied and personified Themselves. all the ancient wisdom that you have been passing on. No, so you're talking about leaders I've worked with or leaders I look up to? Anybody. Okay. So, um, so Ratan Tata is a huge favorite and has been forever. And Tata's as an organization, institution. Um, somebody who gives me weak knees every time yeah. is Barack Obama. Uh, I just think, to me, he's the epitome of, of, of the person that one should be, must be, and that honesty and that authenticity. Yeah. So I'm a huge Barack Obama fan. Yeah. Um, for, for very different reasons. Uh, I'm also a huge Steve Jobs fan. Yeah, I know there, there, there's a lot of personal, uh, you know, mess around him. Yeah, but just that clarity of purpose mm. and that brilliance is to me extraordinary. Yeah. Um, in a very different world, and if you know, I'm, I often get asked, uh, who are the men I would like to date? People I would like to date <laughs> without gender. Um, I wish I lived in the times of Albert Einstein. And I wish I lived in the times of Leonardo da Vinci. Wow. To me, these are people who, curious. Are, who are curious and, uh, you know, all those three things. They have no concept of control yeah. or concern. Yeah. There's no concept of how the world should be or should not yeah. be. They are curious explorers. Yeah. And they are authentic. Yeah. Right? And, and I think to me, that is my superhero. Somebody who's curious, somebody who's authentic, somebody who's fearless, yeah. incredibly fearless. And so Satyajit Ray is the other one that I am a wow. huge um, a fangirl of. Um, and all of them have that common common thread around them. Mm. In fact, at some point in time, Sonia, we must talk about the hero's journeys and, and, and the whole idea of how the reason we have heroes as humans yeah. is because our heroes reflect 
hope mm-hmm. they offer us hope to our personal ideal best mm-hmm. you and i by the way may have the same hero yeah but for very different reasons yeah and we might just see different perspectives in the story completely different completely different perspectives yeah. right so for me that's the my hero is is curious is authentic is fearless yeah and of course there'll be collaterals but they are their best selves yeah you know in fact uh, sonia there's this very nice um, in in the mahavakyas that we have in our ancient wisdom um there's this whole concept there are two mahavakyas that are my favorite so one of them is tatatvam asi tatatvam asi tatatvam asi that which you are and i bow down to the divinity in you hmm but aham brahmasmi ah uh-huh. i am the infinite mm-hmm. divine within my own self yeah and that whole philosophy which says ki are you sort yourself out hmm the world will sort itself hmm so i am somebody who's been a great fan hmm of people who pursue their life with purpose with passion yeah. and with all of themselves i just feel yeah. the people in the process take care of themselves yeah as long as you fulfill your purpose you're you're good so yeah, yeah those are mine um from our own ancient wisdom i'm actually a huge fan of kautilya and and uh, chanakya the yeah. same person uh i'm actually a huge fan of rani lakshmi bai as well is i just wow. think that that kind of fearless warrior house oh, huge and um, of course i am the very huge krishna fan mm-hmm. i have i have always been a yeah. huge krishna fan and and we we are a family of mathura vaishnavs so ah. we've been trained on it personally though if you ask me i identify myself with the shiva so yeah and i see that i think the the underlying you know the one word that comes to me is fearless like fearless yeah. authenticity and tapping that power which comes from within but sonia it's very hard earned huh? it it's is. hard earned b it also has collaterals yeah of course so it doesn't of make course. me the most universally popular person and yeah. that's fine it's it's a very hard earned journey to say it's okay yeah b you yeah the rest will follow yeah so well yeah ah i think this has been such a powerful conversation and i know i can go on because there's a lot that i would love to cover but maybe we could do that in another episode but uh, now that we are here i have uh, this is the you know conversation where we come to a part mm. where i ask you the question that mm. the last cxo who i add on mm. my uh, episode mm. has for you mm. and uh, once you answer that mm. you take the tradition and the ritual forward Yay! you pass on <laughs> your question to the next cxo yes. so the trail kind of keeps blazing the baton keeps on getting passed oh, i love the concept huh, by the way i love the concept i am glad mm-hmm. and uh, i don't know where this concept is inspired from but it is inspired from some podcast just that i forget the name mm-hmm. so nonetheless uh, the question that i have from anjali baba yes uh, who was on my last episode of CXO talks mm. and uh, she is the founder of Voila Experts mm-hmm. so she has a question for you mm. which is that in an ever dynamic space mm. where CXOs are traversing a different journey every living day how do you manage to keep yourself motivated <laughs> as they say success is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, perspiration. uh Unfortunately I'm actually better at the inspiration part than the perspiration part. Um so I keep myself inspired to keep myself motivated. Yeah. Um I actually wake up with a question every single day. So uh-huh. so when I sleep at night I sleep the last thing I do before I sleep at night is that uh, I ask myself a question for tomorrow. So this is the question that I need to find an answer to tomorrow. interesting um and so and because i've slept with that and i believe in that whole the concept of yoga nidra and i allow my 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 mind my brain to go through its own sleep spindles and and churn this uh when i wake up in the morning my question is also much better articulated hmm so uh instead of going to bed with a task list which i know a lot of people do um uh, right on post it right. what they need to do tomorrow uh i go to bed with a question so then i know that when i wake up tomorrow morning uh I am excited about finding the answer to that question. Wow. 
uh it doesn't matter what that question is it could be a emotional question it could be a people question it could be a concept question mm-hmm. uh like there are days i've woken up actually asking and trying to figure out a uh, cryptocurrency wow I, it's not that i know anything much about it uh-huh. but in my mind i'm drawing parallels between what cryptocurrency actually blockchain and i've actually done that uh-huh. drawn parallels between blockchain and the sanatan dharma about what what oh. could have been the uh, the inspiration behind blockchain and that's my interesting that's my question before i sleep So mm-hmm. when I wake up in the morning, my mind itself has churned out enough, enough research material it has given me for next day. Where actually the blockchain is a lot like the Sanatan Dharma. There's no central spine. Mm-hmm. It's True. a distributed ledger with a transaction approved in the past. Interesting. Right? So I find it fascinating. Right. So I go to bed with a question every night, and and that allows me to wake up, uh, recharged, refreshed, and and wanting to answer that question. And so from 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 cryptocurrency, it could be about the human mind. It could be inspiration that technology takes from. It could be about uh, the book that I'm writing. So I have a book coming out called Goddess in the Boardroom. Um, so it could be a question about gender. It could be and it could be a question about how did. So we had feminine goddesses. The feminine goddess cults were the original cults. Uh-huh. How did we become a patriarchal male patriarchal goddess cult also. at all? And then the answer next day leads me to the question, right? So the next day I found out that the Greek cults and so the goddess cults and the, yeah. the hunter forager, pre-hunter forager cults, uh-huh. etc. When we got domesticated, we were still feminine goddess cults, and then we moved on to being uh, when we got land ownership mm-hmm. and decided political boundaries. That's when we became male goddesses. Then that led me to believe, but how is it that India has the greatest living goddess cult alive in the world? So what's the flow there? Etc. Etc. So I just ask myself a question at night before I sleep. Interesting. And that's the only thing I do. So It looks like you already knew what my next question was going to be. <laughs> There's one question that I also ask yes. in this staggered end part of this conversation with every CXO is that. No, everybody has a, every CXO. I feel has a ritual. Yes, and you talk to me about one such ritual that you yes. have, um, that also keeps you motivated and inspired. But uh, tell me more about your rituals that you have, maybe as a part of your day, sometime in the beginning or to the end. You've talked about one ritual that you have that you close the day with. You know, the other ritual I want to talk to you about is something that I I haven't. I see my husband do it. I haven't learnt it necessarily, uh-huh. but he inspires me with it. So we've now been together for almost twenty-five years. We've been married for twenty-one yeah. years. Yeah, it's, it's it's a long time. I agree, but I must confess. So in the days before Excel came into, because we've been seeing each other before Excel. Before came Excel, into the, yes. <laughs> And so, Google. So that is supremely organized. So that's all about lists. So our entire household, if you come there, you will find post-its everywhere, including inside cupboards, including <laughs> inside my cupboard, not just his own. <laughs> everywhere, he, he will organize everybody's life. But I remember. That in the days before Excel, uh-huh. every night he would go to bed after writing in his diary or the journal. Okay, then Excel happened. Oh, Excel was God gift to him. It was like his. He was like a child in a toy store with Excel. <laughs> so for years, for years, Sonia, Sudhat at the beginning of the year mm-hmm. makes a list of goals. Mm-hmm. Along four five parameters. So there's one goal which is on family and friends. One goal which is on. Uh, Financial matters, one which is mm-hmm. a professional goal, one which is a learning goal, whatever is mm-hmm. like criteria. He then writes a specific goal on it. Right, mm-hmm. so family and friends. This year we will take a vacation to Hong Kong Disneyland or whatever it may yeah. be. Right, or uh, in terms of professional degree, this year I shall do this. This I shall pick up these skills. Whatever. Mm-hmm. And then every single day, yeah, he. Tracks what he has done towards that goal for today. That's he's meticulous. done it for years, Sonia. Years, and therefore he is one man I've seen who actually goes to bed every night, asking himself how he is better today than he was yesterday. Wow! So we've tried to implement it as a family. We've been through years on you know four by four. So all four <laughs> of us, four by four by four, all four of us will learn four things. Uh-huh. So sort of one skill, one language, one musical instrument, and one sport. Ah, oh. by by month two or three, he's the only one who's <laughs> doing it, but he does it, right? So in fact, that is what led to the inspiration behind the book that Sadhat and I have co-written, Fifty Two Red Pills. Red it's a learning pills, journey. Yeah. It's it's a pure hyper learning journey. So that's a ritual I'm very very inspired by. Wow, 
my mother my mother goes to bed every so my mother always has a diary and a notepad notepad and a pen next to her always i don't remember ever since i was a child where i woke up and she was asleep at night so when it's at 3:30 or 4 in the morning my only image of my mother is her sitting at her table and chair and i i have i grew up in the forge uh-huh. so we moved lots of houses and cities right but irrespective of how irrespective of circumstance mm-hmm. irrespective of guests or any context mm-hmm. discipline my mother wakes up at 3:30 in the morning and will sit and write right and i i don't ever remember not seeing her on her table or chair after 3:30 in the morning wow i wonder how they do it i think there's this consistency right that leads people to places uh some very powerful rituals that you've yeah. shared and now is the time for you to share the <laughs> next question for the next cxo because uh, that's a ritual that's our ritual yes. for cxo talk yes and and in true spirit of resonance finding passion finding purpose here's my question for the next cxo sonia i want you to ask your cxo what is it that they're truly passionate and purpose driven about what would they do Mm. for themselves in a world where every other need was met so their finances were taken care of somebody told you or say so that your finances are taken care of your family is taken, taken care, care of, of health is taken care of everything is taken care of yeah what would you do for your own self wow and what do you do about it now in your day to day life wow that has me thinking about my answer but I'm not going to share my answer. <laughs> It's for the next CXO. But that's a very very beautiful question. Um and something that will make people really go deep within. Yeah, it it it's that pause of awareness. It's yeah. that little jolt of awareness. Yeah. That allows us to break through our scripts. It does. And uh, with that, uh, we are closing this episode. It's been a very captivating episode eka and i am really grateful uh, to have been blessed with your presence here Aunt. and uh, your resonance here <laughs> and your wisdom here and of course uh, you know the journey will continue i'm sure there will be many more things that we will be continuing to share a lot on and build a better journey for many cxos tatastu again <laughs> <laughs> Indeed so shall be um and thank you so much again for being here it was my pleasure and i'm really grateful for you being here on cxo talks thank you so much sonia it's been it's indeed been a privilege and a pleasure to be here and all the best for all your future cxo talks thank you